Commissioner Ambach joined a coalition of New York State legislators and professional associations to issue a report outlining proposed legislative and administrative reforms to streamline procedures to investigate and prosecute allegations of unprofessional conduct in the state's licensed professions. The following excerpt from the news conference was broadcast by WRGB Schenectady on May 27, 1980. A coalition of New York State legislators and professional associations today unveiled a series of legislative reforms aimed at improving the disciplinary procedures against licensed professionals. That group includes such diverse occupations as masseuses and doctors, all of whom must be licensed by the state. More on the proposed reforms now from Mark Karras. There are currently almost 500,000 licensed professionals operating in New York, and like other occupations, there is sometimes a bad apple in the group. When complaints about an individual practitioner surface, they are referred to the state education or health departments for investigation. At a news conference today, officials released a report indicating that the number of complaints has ballooned to about 15,000 annually, resulting in numerous problems and adversely affecting the enforcement of professional standards on individual practitioners. I think that the shortcomings are well outlined in this report. I would uh, capsule them by way of indicating a problem of time, of backlog, length of time in which it takes for an investigation to take place uh, through the prosecution and final determination by uh, the Board of Regents. And during that period of time, of course, always the, the danger, the difficulty that a person who shouldn't be practicing uh, might continue to be practicing. The report released today recommends a general streamlining of the discipline procedures, allowing the education and health departments to prosecute as well as investigate cases, thereby saving time. In addition, new procedures would be established to handle minor complaints, which can now take up to five years to be resolved. For violations which are not substantial, there should be a diversion two-way peer committee which can assess a small monetary penalty or uh, hand out a censure and reprimand uh, for the first or uh, infrequent violator. State legislators who unveiled the reform package today were flanked by representatives of about 30 professional societies, groups which argue that the proposed reforms would clear up complaints quicker and as a result, weed out the bad apples who may give their professions a poor public image. The leaders in both houses of the state legislature support reforms in the professional discipline area. So with these lawmakers and these other groups supporting the measures, it would seem that their approval is certain, right? Wrong. Enactment of the measures would cost state taxpayers about $2 million a year, and the majority of state lawmakers say that the state just cannot afford it. Mark Karras, News Center 6, Capitol Hill. At a news conference on June 17, 1980, Commissioner Ambach announced that the Bureau of Criminal Investigation of the State Police had been called in to investigate charges that examination questions on certain Regents' examinations had been sold in New York City prior to the actual examinations. At the same time, the Commissioner announced that the Regents' examinations would be administered as scheduled and that their grading would depend upon the results of the investigation. The following is WTEN's coverage of the news conference. There is another Regents' exam scandal. The state's top educator admitted today the security has been breached on at least two, possibly more, of this year's examinations. Here's Bob Lawson at the State Education Department. The story of the cheating scandal first broke in yesterday's editions of the New York Post. The Post revealed that questions on the comprehensive English exam administered yesterday throughout the state were available in advance of the testing hour. And today, the Post reported that copies of not only the English exam, but also the social studies exam, were on sale in New York City for $1,000. The paper said it had purchased a copy of this morning's social studies test for $250 and printed a portion of the exam on the front page. State educational officials set out to determine if, in fact, the tight security surrounding the exams had been compromised. And at midday, Education Commissioner Gordon Ambach revealed the disturbing findings. The department immediately asked the Bureau of Com Criminal Investigation of the Division of State Police to investigate that report, and an investigation is underway. 
Early this morning, the same newspaper advised us that its staff had purchased copies of questions which were said to be included in the Social Studies Regents' Examination, which was administered this morning. These questions were, in fact, on that examination. The Post also reported that it had questions for the physics exam, which will be given tomorrow morning. But probably because of timing, Ambach would neither confirm nor deny those questions are actually on the test. The commissioner did, however, announce his decision on the rest of the exam schedule. Based on the information presently available, I have determined that all of the Regents' examinations will be administered this week throughout the state as scheduled. Whether the grading of any Regents examination will be affected by these developments will depend upon the results of the investigation and upon any further developments between now and the end of the examination period, which is Thursday morning. Commissioner Ambach says he has no information that there has been any exam security leak upstate, and he just doesn't know how widespread the cheating scam is. And he is very concerned, he says, about the additional anxiety and tension the scandal places on students taking Regents' exams. Bob Lawson, TV10 Action News, Albany. The following is WRGB's coverage of the news conference. First of all, there's a bit of an anxiety. Is the exam going to be given or isn't it going to be given? That's added on top of all the anxiety that everybody has before they take a test in the first instance. As a result of Ambach's announcement today, students can rest assured that the remaining exams will in fact be given. But if state police confirm the leaking of test questions, then some exam results may very well be invalidated. If that occurs, Ambach says there are several routes which can be taken, the most likely of which would be to give Regents credit to anyone with a passing grade prior to the exam. Mark Karras, New Center 6, Albany. Shenandoah High School, like other area school districts, keeps its Regents' exams in a locked vault. Assistant Principal Ed Kern is the only man authorized to handle them. He receives the tests about a week before they are given, locked in Wells Fargo-like steel boxes. The State Bureau of Testing mails the keys in a separate envelope. I think the department has given us every guideline where, if followed, it's difficult to imagine how anything could go wrong at the high school level with security for these examinations. We're given step-by-step -step instructions which cover every moment from ordering the examinations to returning them to Albany or to filing them for our own use. What about the combination to the vault? Where is it kept? It's kept uh, on the campus in a locked file. Is the file locked all day? The file is not locked all day. It's usually open during the course of it. The intruder would have to pick the locks on the steel boxes and steal the cellophane sealed tests. Their loss would be detected when the tests are handed out. I'm standing outside of the gymnasium of Shenandoah High School where students have just finished taking the biology exam. Many of them are worried it may not count. Students nervous about the Regents' exams had something extra to worry about. In 1974, when a similar scandal surfaced, the tests were invalidated, some never given. At that time, regions were not necessary for graduation. This year, however, the English regions may be used as a competency test, and without a passing score, some seniors may not graduate. Well, I don't want to take it over again. I mean, I've studied all night, and if, if somebody has the answers, um, I don't think it's fair for just to say some people take it over because I don't I didn't take the answer. I don't have them. I don't think it's really that fair that we should have to take it over when I don't know anybody that was cheating or anything. I don't think anybody was down here. But I don't think it's fair that we should have to suffer for the kids in New York City. At this point, the regents have made no determination on whether the exams will pass. That will come after the state police investigation. Alec Roberts, New Center 6, Clifton Park. The following are excerpts from the 10th commencement of the Regents' External Degrees Convocation, held in Chancellor's Hall on September 24, 1980. It gives me great pleasure at this time to present to you the Commissioner of Education and President of the University, the Honorable Gordon M. Ambach who will call the graduates forward to receive their diplomas. President Ambeck. <laughs> Mr. Chairman.
Chancellor, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees of Associate in Arts and Associate in Science. Alvin Leerheimer, director of the program, will read their names. Will the candidates for the Associate in Arts and Associate in Science degrees now rise? Mr. Chancellor, I now have the honor to present four awards for academic excellence. First is the Ewald B. Nyquist Award. Like all other college programs, the Regents External Degree Program has among its graduates some who stand out with unusual distinction. Each year we honor the class by selecting one of these individuals as commencement speaker. In addition, we mark the occasion by presenting four student awards. The intent of these awards, established by the Board of Regents and the Regents External Degree faculty, was first to honor certain distinguished educators whose early participation in the program's development profoundly influenced its quality and direction, and second, to recognize outstanding achievement among those adult learners whose goal the program has served. The first of these awards, which carries with it a stipend of $250, was established by the Regents in recognition of the author of Regents External Degrees, the former Commissioner of Education and President of the University of the State of New York, Ewald B. Nyquist. At the outset of his administration in 1970, he conceived the idea of a non-traditional college program designed to allow adult learners to pursue study while simultaneously pursuing their other responsibilities. With persistence and skill, he pursued his vision to the reality we celebrate today. Appropriately, the faculty based their selection of the Nyquist Award winner on these criteria, academic excellence in independent study and personal qualities exemplifying the spirit of self-reliance and determination that are at the heart of this program. I am pleased to announce that the third an annual Nyquist Award goes this year to a recipient of the Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree Joanne I. Lamb. Ms. Lamb, who is incidentally 41 years of age, achieved a fine academic record in independent study while she continued her work as a registered nurse. She is now employed in the cardiac transplant unit of Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. I believe it's because of those obligations that she is not able to attend today to accept her award. But we did want to recognize it at this time. The second award is the Leroy V. Good Memorial Award. In the formative years of the program, we were privileged to have the able and dedicated service of a distinguished educator, the former president of Monroe Community College, Dr. Leroy V. Good. His pioneering work in the community college movement gained him national recognition, and his profound commitment to the welfare of young people and to education of a competent citizenry won him the respect and affection of all who knew him. With Regents' concurrence, his faculty colleagues established the Good Memorial Award to be given annually to an associate degree graduate who has achieved an outstanding academic record in independent study. The graduate selected to receive the third annual award is Diane Bush, who enrolled in the Regents' external degree program while living in Germany on her return to the United States, she continued work toward her associate in arts, mostly by examination. She continues to present a fine record of study toward her goal of a Bachelor of Arts degree from the Regents. I am pleased to present the Leroy V. Good Award to Diane Bush. Diane? Charles W. Laughton, Jr. Memorial Award. 
In the early days of the external degrees program development, the regents had the good fortune to receive the support and counsel of a giant in the community college field, the former president of the State University of New York Agricultural and Technical College at Farmingdale, Charles W. Laffin, Jr. A distinguished educator, Dr. Laffin always seized opportunities to extend the benefits of higher education beyond the limited reach of established systems. He was also a skilled administrator who could adapt available resources to ever new and more ambitious goals. In recognition of his achievements and in gratitude for his long and active service, on behalf of the program, the faculty established the Laffin Memorial Award to be given annually to a graduate who compiles a superior academic record at the university while completing most degree requirements through independent study. This year's recipient is Bruce M. Allen of Albany, New York, who earned a Bachelor of Science in Business while he continued to operate his own business consulting firm. Mr. Allen prepared independently for examinations and earned perfect scores in several of the Regents Program business examinations. It gives me great pleasure to present the Charles W. Laffin, Jr. Memorial Award to Bruce M. Allen. award was established by the Regents External Degree Nursing Faculty to recognize outstanding academic and professional achievement among its graduates. The award honors a founding member of the Nursing Committee, Dr. Ruth V. Matheny, who contributed substantially to its groundbreaking work and to the rigorous standards for which the external degree written and performance examinations in nursing have come to be known. Dr. Matheny was nationally acclaimed for her theories on patient-centered practices in nursing. The third award given to Mary Ann Brent, who has established a remarkable academic record in the Associate in Science program in nursing. As a result, she advanced from a licensed practical nurse to a registered nurse and now cares for medical surgical patients at Putnam Community Hospital. I am proud to present the Ruth B. Matheny Award winner, Mary Ann Brandt. I share the Chancellor's pleasure in welcoming you to this commencement celebration and to this beautiful day in Albany. I congratulate those of you who are here today and extend good wishes to all of the 2,600 graduates of the class of 1980. The 10th commencement brings us to a vantage point from which to reflect on the decade of the Regents' external degree program. It was in 1971 when we marshaled a faculty drawn from various colleges and universities to plan a degree which could be awarded for college-level work accomplished without mandatory ties to any one classroom or any one campus. At the beginning of this venture, the entire staff could sit around a conference table. In 1972, when the first students completed their degree requirements, the graduating class in its entirety was 77 people. Since then, the program has grown so that enrollment of active degree candidates has topped 20,000. 14,000 adults are now alumni of the external degree program. Our staff alone numbers more than did the first graduating class. From the beginning, 
Our objective was to open college opportunity to all who can qualify. Our graduating class of 1980 demonstrates success with that objective. Consider the diversity. Telephone technician, alcoholism counselor, a Baptist minister, licensed practical nurse. Age no longer dictates educational potential. The average age of graduates is in the late 30s, an age when in earlier days, college seemed considered to be long in the past. Access to a college education is not enough, however. To make the most of their learning, adult learners must have access to education of quality. From the beginning, the Regents External Degree Program has had a certain formula for achieving academic quality. The vast resources of the University of the State of New York, coupled with a distinguished faculty drawn from across the college spectrum. Our university, established way back in 1784, has grown into a unified system which encompasses all public and private educational institutions in the state of New York, the colleges, the universities, the primary and secondary schools, public and non-public, the museums, the libraries, public television, all of these together in one university. As this university's president, I applaud the way in which the region's external degree has combined the learning which is available through these many institutions toward a college credential. The essence of the external degree program is flexibility the freedom of each candidate to choose the right path among diverse learning options to earn a degree. With freedom, however, goes responsibility. The responsibility for maintaining high academic standards in this program lies, of course, in part with the candidates and mainly with the faculty. Educational quality is given great attention in this program. While it challenges many of the traditional assumptions of higher education, it must demonstrate persuasively that each alternate route to a degree is equal in rigor. The task of our faculty is demanding. The faculty must establish and maintain degree requirements and performance standards, which will assure that students whom they have never seen and who earn their credits from thousands of traditional and non-traditional sources have genuinely completed a college program. The degrees must carry a value and reputation which enables graduates to compete as equals for positions and further education with counterparts who have completed more traditional programs. The faculty of the Regents External Degrees is equal to this task their distinguished educators, their presidents, deans, administrative officers, and teaching faculty, all bringing valuable talents in their own academic disciplines. They represent a broad spectrum of undergraduate education in public and independent institutions, two-year and four-year, from New York and from a number of other states. Their diverse perspectives on educational policies and practices gives this program a truly national character. Just as we share pride in the continuing work of the faculty, we also share pride in new program developments. May I comment on three? New connections with business and government organizations, our nursing program, and on our alumni. Universities must serve communities as well as individuals. And one way of doing this is to assist in the training of personnel in businesses and in industries and in governmental units. During the past year, the Regents External Degree staff has devoted much energy to helping employers provide better educational programs by combining their own in-service training courses with Regents External Degree opportunities. One such effort will be of interest to you. Just in August of this year, I was pleased to join with Xerox Corporation Vice President Martin Mayer to announce a cooperative venture with Xerox to provide external degree enrollment, information, and advising services to Xerox employees. This new association provides a dual benefit. 
At the same time employees improve their work skills, they can use the credits from their training courses towards Regents' degrees. Those degrees, in turn, will enhance their own professional standing. For employers like Xerox, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Western Company of North America, and others, the partnership with the external degree program has meant an important new incentive for their employees to expand their skills through training and education, and an added benefit which helps to attract new employees and retain experienced ones. You can expect to hear more during this coming year about expansion of these services which the external degree program is performing for business and industry. A note on our nursing program. For the past eight years, external degrees in nursing have been an important catalyst to the profession as a whole. The program has demonstrated forcefully that nursing skills can be tested externally, a development which has had a strong impact on all of nursing education. 42 states now accept Regents external degree graduates for licensure, and others are expected to join the list in the near future. The performance testing, which is the most innovative feature of the external degree in nursing, has been greatly expanded during this year. A third testing site has been established with New York State, that is at the Krauss Irving Memorial Hospital in Syracuse, and through a major grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the nursing program has worked in concert with the California State University and College Consortium to establish a performance testing center at Long Beach, California. The new center will not only make our performance test much more accessible to candidates on the West Coast, it also signals the adoption by the California State Consortium of these examinations as a part of their own nursing curriculum. A note on alumni. Finding one's way among educational alternatives, as our graduates know, is not an easy task. It takes a great deal of help and comfort. I'm impressed by the concern that our graduates have shown for others. For a college program that has no nostalgia for the profs or the proms, the football team or any other team, or the campus, our 14,000 alumni of this program have made exceptional statements of their own support starting in this past year. Contributions to our alumni fund, which was in its first year this past year, have now already exceeded more than ten thousands of dollars. And perhaps most important, these funds will be used to support resource networks of alumni and friends which have already been established in Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. These locations were chosen because of concentration of enrolled candidates and the accompanying need for encouragement and support, as well as the enthusiasm of local alumni. Through the network, graduates give something which is even more important than money. The valuable advice drawn from their own experience in fitting the responsibilities of jobs and families with the preparation for a college degree. We thank the alumni and those who, of you who will carry on with this same commitment. We do so just as we praise you, the graduates who joined their company today. In November 1981, the leadership of the three major faiths in New York, the New York Board of Rabbis, the New York State Catholic Conference, and the New York State Council of Churches joined together to issue a statement of affirmation and support for public education. The following 10-minute program features members of the Interfaith Advisory Council discussing the statement with Commissioner Ambach. On November 3rd, the program was sent to 35 television stations and 200 radio stations. We are pleased to present New York State Education Commissioner Gordon Ambach with three members of the Commissioner's Interfaith Education Advisory Council. They're here to comment on the recent Statement on Affirmation and Support of Religious Institutions for Public Education. 
Commissioner Rombach. Just as the church and synagogue require the support of the educational community to achieve their purposes, education requires the active support of church and synagogue. That is a part of a very important new statement, which has been endorsed by the New York Board of Rabbis, the New York State Catholic Conference, and the New York State Council of Churches. It is a statement on affirmation and support of religious institutions for public education. Thank you for joining us. We'd like to take this opportunity to talk about this statement. I'm joined by colleagues from the Interfaith Education Advisory Council who are instrumental in preparing this statement. Dr. Gloria Rasbury of Syracuse, Father Howard Bassler of Brooklyn, Rabbi Martin Silverman of Albany. The historical background of this paper is important. Father Bassler? Well, the paper is an effort to put into context the concern of religious persons for the quality of education, and specifically public education. As you know, we meet quarterly, and very often our conferences and consultation deals with issues, sometimes conflicts, and we felt it would be constructive and, I guess, necessary, given the climate of the day, to step back and to express as clearly and succinctly as we could the reason for our being with you as religious representatives and to state that we are part of a, a long tradition of religious concern for public education in our country. Well, the statement provides a strong reason for having such a statement at this point and then develop some historical background. Well, to quote from it for a moment, we say right at the beginning that education in America can be traced from the mission schools of the Spanish and French colonists to the more formal schools for clergy and laity in theocratic New England. And what we meant to say in that simple way was that the people who founded our country from the beginning saw education as essential to the fabric and quality of life. And we feel that we are part of that tradition meeting with you. And certainly the Jewish immigrants who came in such large numbers at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, used the public schools as their major means of integration into American society. The public school was looked upon by the first and second generation uh, Jewish immigrants as the main instrument by which they became Americans and have established themselves as probably the most important Jewish community in the world today. The paper then has this kind of historical background, but of course it notes that in that historical background there have been tensions. Oh yes, uh, very often uh, the religious community and the public education community look upon each other as competitors and they uh, even condemn each other publicly for what they're doing. And uh, at this point in history, public education is coming under great fire because of other things in society which are coming to a focus at this particular point. And the statement deals with this phenomenon in the following sentences. Schools and other formal educational institutions are being called upon to accomplish more for more persons than ever before. These demands are at times reasonable, at times excessive. I think there's a very real sense in which um, that statement speaks to the tension that has existed in the past. And uh, one particular area of concern has been that of minority, education of the minorities, in which the church might very well have been a support for public education as opposed to a critic, a support in the sense that it develops the moral conscience of citizens uh, in support of understanding and equal education for all. And we feel that there is a, an important sense in which this needs to be changed from criticism to support and to bring this kind of statement to the attention of our religious bodies uh, and citizens throughout the state uh, is an important contribution to education in itself, shifting from tension and conflict to another area. So it has in the statement a very strong emphasis on the mutual support 
very strong. And I think that it's certainly true of our traditions, the Judeo-Christian tradition, that we speak very often of the fact that we are our brother's keeper. And in the public sector, we hear that no man is an island. And this is very definitely true in the area of our concern with the quality of life of the individual and being responsible for those around us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, then is actually um, we put into action in the things that we do. And the church then assuming this role of support for the public schools becomes an agent in improving the lot of those around us. And that becomes a tremendously important. Well, don't you perceive, or do you perceive in our own day, a, a tendency of people to identify the educational mission almost exclusively with the administrators, teachers, school boards, those formally involved in the system? Very definitely. And I think this is in part due to the fact that we have looked at the, uh, our role as neutral, becoming neutral agents or remaining neutral agents and have misinterpreted that. I think that neutrality has meant that we do not try to impose our religious tradition or beliefs on those in the schools, insisting that they uh, conform in one way or another. But it has not meant that we fail to intervene or to participate in changing and speaking to issues, whether it be uh, discipline or education for the handicapped, uh, creating a climate of concern in the whole area of competency and uh, teacher and student competency, of becoming informed about the needs, the specific things that will make a difference in the quality of lives of those who hear sermons or sit next to us in pews, or whether it's in uh, Sabbath school or in church or service or what have you. We have here a very unique uh, circumstance, this unique statement which has been endorsed by three major faiths. What are the next steps? What, what's the importance of this statement across our state? I think we need to really move to exactly some of the things that are indicated in the statement and expect that those who read it will realize that uh, in a very large and definite sense there is a concern uh, on the part of our religious bodies that we act out our beliefs, that we take part in the activities in our community. I would imagine that we will be hearing these in, in sermons and in organizational meetings, that we will receive them in our congregations, and that from there we will take heart, uh, take to heart some of the words that are in this very statement, Father Basil. And certainly the council, in its discussions as we were drawing up the statement, uh, expressed the feeling that by having the statement endorsed by the major religious institutions in the state, that on the uh, grassroots level in the individual synagogue and individual church throughout uh, our community, that some of these conflicts and tensions will be diffused and that the people in this state who look to religion as a guide will use the religious values to help strengthen uh, public education in New York State. I'll just go back to the statement, the final paragraph, which speaks to some of the ways in which that strengthening would take place. We ask for religiously committed people to really take as their own responsibility for the quality of public education in community, state, and nation. And we say that they should be willing candidates for local school boards, active participants in parent-teacher organizations. They should be responsible in their evaluation and support of educational budgets and advocate educational innovation and improvement for all, and we add especially among the poor and disadvantaged. I thank you, Father Bassler, Rabbi Silverman, Dr. Raspberry. Thank you for joining us to hear something about this very important statement. This statement has been endorsed by the New York Board of Rabbis, by the New York State Catholic Conference, and by the New York State Council of Churches. It will be widely distributed throughout our state and by the State Education Department. We hope that you will read it and that you will discuss it and that you will follow its implications. Thank you. Copies of this statement are available from Public Information, the New York State Education Department, Albany, New York, 12234. To encourage parents to visit schools during American Education Week, 
November 16th through 22nd, 1980, Commissioner Ambach and Joe Ferguson, quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, taped five public service announcements. The public service announcements were broadcast in New York State by 35 television and 100 radio stations. I'm New York State Education Commissioner Gordon Ambach. Visit the schools in your community during American Education Week, November 16 through 22. I'm Joe Ferguson of the Buffalo Bills. Team up with your schools. Visit them during American Education Week, November 16th through the 22nd. I'm Joe Ferguson of the Buffalo Bills. Your local schools have planned some great things for you to see during American Education Week. Education Commissioner Gordon Ambach and I urge you to visit them. Thanks, Joe. Plan to visit your schools during American Education Week, November 16 through 22. 16, 22, November. Hi, I'm Joe Ferguson, quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, calling out the dates of the American Education Week. I'm joining Education Commissioner Gordon Ambach to urge you to visit your schools during this week. Discover the exciting things taking place in education. Thanks, Joe. Visit your schools during November 16 through 22. See how they are preparing your children for the future. Education in the 80s, preparation for the future. That's the theme of American Education Week being observed by the schools in your community from November 16 through 22. 16, 22, November. I'm Joe Ferguson, quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. I run the offense, we score the touchdowns. There's another part of this team too, our defense. It takes both parts to play winning football. It's that way in education too. Your public schools are putting points on the board with students. They need you, the other part of the team, for support. Get in a huddle with the folks who run your schools during American Education Week. Join me and Commissioner Garden Ambach in supporting education. Thank you, Joe. Teamwork is a big part of education. Join the team, visit your schools during American Education Week, November 16 through 22. This message brought to you by the New York State Education Department. Rabbi Silverman, a member of the Commissioner's Interfaith Advisory Council, and Commissioner Gordon Ambach discussed the origin and purpose of the Interfaith Advisory Council statement of affirmation and support for public education by religious institutions with moderator Charles Tuey. The program was broadcast on Albany Cable Channel 16. Recently, the Interfaith Advisory Council, appointed by the New York State Commissioner of Education, Gordon Ambach, issued a statement of affirmation and support of religious institutions for public education. On our last program, two endorsers of this statement Bishop Howard Hubbard of the Albany Catholic Diocese and Reverend Robert Lamar, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Albany, shared with us their thoughts on the importance of public education and the crucial role educators, spiritual leaders, and parents play in helping our children to achieve an understanding of moral, ethical, and spiritual values. To continue our discussion, we have with us this evening Gordon Ambach, Commissioner of Education of the State of New York, and Rabbi Martin Silverman of Albany's own Temple Beth Emmet, who is a member of the Commissioner's Advisory Council. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you Alex. My first question, I believe, uh, maybe to Rabbi, would be what were the origins of this statement from the Interfaith Advisory Council? It began about a year ago at one of our regular quarterly meetings when the feeling was expressed by a number of people that there was a gap, at least in people's minds, between public and religious education. And uh, all of us on the council were unanimous in our feeling that this was something that, uh, the perception was something that we did not want to foster. And we wanted to indicate how we, as representatives of religious groups, could uh, endorse public education uh, in our state and the concept generally. So that uh, a committee was formed and uh, they came back with a statement which was then ripped to pieces, of course, put back together again 
And after a while, this, I think, very beautiful statement uh, was accepted not only by our council, but also by the New York Board of Rabbis, the New York State Catholic Conference, and the New York State Council of Churches. Thank you, Rabbi. Commissioner, your role in all of this? The Interfaith Advisory Council is comprised of about uh, 15 to 20 persons who represent the major faiths within the state of New York. This council has been in existence for several years. It provides for me and for my colleagues <coughs> in the department and for the members of the Board of Regents an extremely important forum through which religious leaders are expressing their concerns about education and particularly about public education. I make that distinction because it's not a council which is focused itself on education which is religiously sponsored. Their concern always has been about the issue of uh, the religious institutions and concerns for what was happening in, in public education. As Rabbi indicates, it was about a year ago that there was a sense of importance for the council to begin preparing the statement that we're talking about today. There is no precedent for this in New York, and I know of no precedent for such a statement any place else in the United States, where, in fact, representatives of the major faiths have come together to agree on this uh, very concise but uh, very powerful statement, very clear statement about the importance of public education in this country and the importance to the religious institutions of public education. You mentioned that uh, it became apparent that it was time to issue this. Was there any particular event that this spurred this on, or was it a general feeling in the state ed department? There was no particular event, and uh, I do want to repeat something that Rabbi said. The initiative came from the advisory council, not from the department. Mm -hmm. It's, of course, a project that's had my very strong endorsement all the way through, but the initiative was from the members of the advisory council. Uh, I think that uh, one readily sees today, and one did a year ago, uh, many issues on which there might be divisions between public and non-public schools and the auspices sponsors of public and non-public schools. Those are very sharp differences right, right at the moment on certain kinds of issues that are before the Congress, on uh, funding issues. But indeed, there, there were such issues back a year ago and even, even before that time. And uh, a feeling that uh, what seemed to be issues at between the two sets of schools or their sponsorship uh, shouldn't be permitted to be seen as issues which were between public schools and religious institutions. There are, after all, in our state, 17% of our children in non-public schools, 83% of the children in, are in public schools. These children are the children who are also within the religious institutions, those in the public schools, and they have, therefore, a very strong commitment to their children who are in the public schools. But it was a general feeling, not a single event or a specific event, that led to uh, the development and then the issuance of the statement. How does the statement interface with uh, the existing pu uh, private and parochial school system? Well, uh, it's, let's say what it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not a statement to the effect that public education is more important than education right. in non-public schools and or the other way around. Right. There was not any attempt to try to draw a comparison as to which was uh, more important. Indeed, I think it's an expression that, that education is important. And it is important that the religious institutions support it. But the statement does not really speak specifically to the issue of the role of religious institutions in providing education uh, of, a, of religious nature, nor does it speak specifically to uh, the importance of the maintenance of non-public schools. If I might add yes. something uh, to what the commissioner said earlier and also to this, I don't see that uh, we, in drawing this up, we're trying to, uh, we certainly were not trying to put the two school systems uh, on opposite ends of the pole. Uh, and in it, we indicate that there's room for both. But uh, recently, uh, this new report by uh, Professor Coleman on re religious education, religious schools, and public schools has been handled in the press in such a way as to indicate that there is competition and that one is trying to outdo the other. 
and very possibly the fact that we have this statement here in New York will indicate that at least in our state, we uh, do not feel that this competition exists, that each of them have their own roles. Um, the public schools of necessity must be pluralistic. Uh, Bishop Hubbard and both, uh, and Bishop Hubbard and Re Reverend Lamar on our last program suggested some specific uh, ways of, uh, of dealing with the spirituality of school children. Uh, they talked of uh, perhaps having courses in religion, survey courses, courses, courses in ethics and moral values. What would be your feeling of those, on those sort of things? Well, it depends on what level they would be introduced, and it would also depend a great deal on the teacher preparation for this. Uh, I've had enough experience uh, dealing with these things to know that it's a loaded type of uh, subject, mm -hmm. uh, where you get a teacher who is strongly committed to a particular religious tradition. It takes a lot of training to teach that particular teacher how to handle a sensitive issue uh, without bringing uh, a particularistic idea into the teaching itself. There's clearly a combined role here for the family, for the religious institution, the synagogue, or the church, and for the school, and the overall development or nurturing of any uh, child, and the division as to the responsibilities of which aspects are stressed uh, principally in, in which of those settings. Uh, this uh, statement is not uh, particularly advocating that there be any kind of special uh, courses or uh, religious instruction uh, within the schools. Indeed, of course, in New York, we have a lengthy history with respect to release time and the issue of formal religious instructions, how that should be done in particular settings and what the limits are within, uh, within the public schools. But I think that uh, there is, of course, underpinning a very fundamental responsibility of the schools, which is in the development of the civic responsibility of any child. A very close traditional link between the spiritual and the moral values, which are uh, religious values, and the very underpinnings of our democratic society and the rule of law. And I think it's principally on the issues of how one develops the civic responsibility, the self-discipline, which in, leads, in turn leads then to a sense of discipline which is essential in order to keep a society together. It's in that sense, and in the sense of our religious history, uh, ethical history, that I think there is uh, good ground for the incorporation within school programs, in the social studies, in the literature that's read, for an understanding of what those traditions are. Picking up on that, I'd like to read a few sentences from the statement itself. Schools and other formal educational institutions are being called upon to accomplish more for more persons than ever before. These demands are at times reasonable, at times excessive. It is a task that we feel will be more difficult to achieve without the close cooperation and support between educational and religious communities. And we might have added there uh, the homes also. Because uh, what this is saying to me is that we've thrown uh, a lot of our problems at the schools, whether they be public or parochial, and expect them to do things which many parents, for often for reasons beyond their control, uh, were doing in another generation and cannot do or will not do today. And what we're saying here, it's not fair. Let's have some help. Going back a bit to the, uh, the school atmosphere itself, uh, the commissioner mentioned the humanities in particular, which would be the reasonable uh, forum for this inculcation of uh, the values of uh, both ethic and, ethnic and spiritual values. Um, how do you see the, the humanities being rejuvenated, or should they be taught in a different way? Should the, how, how can the teachers become more aware of this so that they can become reflective of the intent of this statement? Well, that's a tough question right now. You have all sorts of teachers, mm -hmm. and you have all sorts of teacher training institutions. Uh, and I think that the teacher, the individual teacher, of course, has to reflect his or her own background and his or her own education. 
so that uh, what this statement is doing is putting out before those people who are sensitive to what we think uh, the American way of life and democracy and education is all about, putting it in clear issues and taking away the idea that there is any kind of opposition between public education and religious education. Uh, we look upon this more as a complementary, uh, two streams going in the same direction, but not fighting each other. I'd like to take us back just yeah. a moment or two, though, to uh, what is the principal purpose of this statement. Uh, and that is, uh, in the simplest terms, as as clear and direct a statement as could possibly made, be made about the importance of having our religious institutions say that public education in this society is absolutely essential and that the resources that are necessary from the public in order to support public education must be forthcoming and that persons who are of religious persuasion and affiliated with the various institutions that endorse this statement have a very particular obligation to support public education, both in the sense of their support of budgets and also to support public education in their own personal commitment, whether it be in service on school boards, whether it be service in parent organizations, in other kinds of advocacy groups, uh, which are focused exactly on the issue of enough resource for a public education. Given our current circumstances with respect to very likely or proposed major changes of federal budgeting, difficulties in our state and at our local levels in New York with respect to the competition for resources, and the overall very severe fiscal concerns, this kind of statement has to be read in the sense of a priority and an importance for public education as coming from the religious institutions. I'd like to summarize by saying that we can agree that ethical and moral values do have religious foundations, and the public educational process must find ways to recognize this influence without disrupting the separation of church and state. It's important for each of us to become aware of our individual responsibilities for education of our children and to understand the attitudes, policies, and practices that affect public education. I'd like to invite comments from our viewing audience. You can write to me, Charles Tuohy, at 53 Ramsey Place, Albany, New York, 12208. 